everybody, it's Brian Burns, and welcome to this episode of the B2B Revenue Leadership Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about social media and how to both advertise and leverage content to engage our audience. What's working today? What's changed? And where is it going? I think these are all topics that, whether you're in sales or marketing, trying to engage and get at your total addressable market is always a challenge and it's a moving <laughs> target. Uh, as soon as something starts to work uh, within a few months, it stops working. So we're going to kind of give you an update on all of that uh, with my buddy, Sean. He's going to come on. We're going to talk through it. And at the end, I'll, I'll sum it up as well as give you an update on the courses and help you engage with your audience, start the conversation, get the meeting. I think you'll really enjoy it. I'm going to also have a testimonial for one of the students who's having enormous success with it. So if you're looking to start conversations and get meetings with your target market, and whether you're in marketing or in sales, I've got a course on it, as well as a free ebook on how companies make product selections. And you can schedule a 15 minute uh, conversation to see if it's a match for you at b2brevenue.com. Uh, just uh, go to training, uh, the calendar link is there. You can pick a time, fit your needs, and we can just talk it through. Uh, that's it. Let's get Sean on the line. Hey, Sean, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, tell us about yourself. Yeah, sure. So uh, I've been doing social media for about 10 years now. Uh, I've been focusing the last few years on B2B social media. So that really spans the, uh, the spectrum of content, of, uh, content creation to uh, listening to analytics to uh, strategy to you know, putting together post-mortem. Uh, decks and uh, you know presenting to presenting my findings to uh, CMOs and marketing departments in hopes that the research that I've done and the findings that I, I have can help direct their marketing efforts. So, like I said, I've been doing it for about ten years. Uh, I'm a graduate of Manhattanville College Integrated Marketing, and um, while I was there, you know, I was trying to learn as much as I could about social media. And so, what I decided to do was every class that I took. I tried to put a social media spin on it. And so if I took an advertising class or a public relations class, I'd write my paper, do my presentation on social media. Uh, while I was doing this, I started amassing this comfortability and knowledge of social. So I decided to hang my shingle out while I was still in school uh, to become a social media consultant. And I haven't looked back since. It, it's been a fantastic ride. You know, I was the first social media manager for the New York City Marathon. Um, and I don't know if your listeners are from New York, but they are runners in New York City are a very passionate bunch about their sport. Okay. Uh, and they have opinions on social and they're not afraid to share them. So it was interesting, kind of a, uh, it was baptism by fire, really learning about that. Uh, so since then, I've worked with a couple of ad agencies in the city. I've worked for client side, agency side, and recently with a focus on B2B. And what was the motivation to go out on your own? That must have been a little scary, huh? Very scary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll be the first to admit it. Uh, you know, it's it's been really cool because, you know, when you're, you're a contractor, you're brought in for a specific problem. You know, the client comes to you and says, I can't do this. Can you do this? So you come in there with your expertise, your knowledge, and you, you come in there to with a solution, right? So your uh, your impact is felt immediately. And you get to see the results of what of the project you worked on, and then you know before there's before there's a burnout, you get to move on to your next contract and do it all over again. So while you're doing this, you're amassing experience on uh, on all these different clients and their different uh, sets of business, and uh, you know you really just you, you build out your wheelhouse from there. So I, I found it's been really interesting. I will admit it gets a little lonely sometimes <laughs> because you're working remotely. Yeah. Um, and you know, you, 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 uh, you don't necessarily get to build a camaraderie with the team, but like I said, the impact is felt so immediately that I find it to be rewarding. And how did they find out about you? What, what's the way to that you network or advertise or market to them or sell to them? Oh, great question. So, uh, when I first started out in social media, I started being involved with the social media club in New York city and the social media club of North Jersey, uh, put together, you know, I started networking, uh, you know, sending emails out to, to friends who are working for different companies, offering my services. Uh, a friend of mine 
is a creative director at an ad agency up in Boston. So, you know, I went up there and gave a presentation on social media and how it can impact uh, your clients' brands and your clients' marketing efforts. And from there, I just started expanding my network as much as possible. You know, I'm comfortable doing an elevator pitch and getting people excited about my brand. And, you know, sometimes I go through a recruiter or a headhunter, what have you. Uh, more often than not, it's just through my network alone and people remember working with me and then bringing me aboard. And why do they go outside versus just doing it inside? Um, you know, because I, I kind of grew up in this, you know, with pay-per-click area, you know, with Google AdWords and now with, you know, f Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, mm -hmm. YouTube. <laughs> is it just knowledge or is it technique? Is it strategy? You, you know, I, I think it's a, a little bit of all what you said. Yeah. Um, you know, I, because I'm a contractor and I come in, I have to stay abreast of everything that's going on in social. You know, I, I have I have a feedly set up of a ton of social media and marketing uh, feeds, and I'm constantly reading those in the morning, staying on top of all the trends as much as possible. So I, I bring that fresh perspective into a company. So, you know, there may be people that are doing social that are just – you know, they're, they're pigeonholed. They might just be working on organic or they might just be working on blog posts. And I come in with this wide wheelhouse and, you know, I can draw from my experience and offer a fresh perspective on the, uh, the projects they're working on. And, and have you seen a pattern of the particular problem that they're experiencing that's causing them to reach out to you? Yes, definitely. So uh, like I alluded to before, um, when we were talking, uh, organic social is dead. You know, uh, <laughs> I'll be the first. To How do you feel it. about it? Yeah. Uh, I know, right? I don't pull any punches. Um, you know, just throwing a post up on Facebook for, for the sake of throwing a post up doesn't really do anything. You're not exciting an audience. You're not your your message probably isn't getting through to anybody with the algorithms and Instagram and Facebook. Um, and how about, doing, how about oh, putting a blog post on your website? That's not doing much. Uh, well, it's it's not if you don't promote it. And so yeah. paid social needs to be can't just exist in a vacuum. It has to be tied into the organic that you're doing. It has to be tied in to to your blog post. Um, and, you know, really, when, when people see this cohesion between all of your units, they get a, a sense of your brand voice. And if you're just doing one, you know, your one hand is doing blog posts and isn't really tying into the paid advertising that you're doing, there's a disconnect. Right. So. You know, a, lo a lot of the things I promote on paid social is getting people to read those blog posts, right? So getting them uh, top of funnel, so tofu uh, to for brand awareness and consideration, and uh, you know, getting people excited about introducing them about the brand and getting them excited about the brand. Uh, you know, blog posts are great for SEO. I'll be the first to admit that. You know, uh, so your search results, the more you get, you know, you get those keywords into your blog post the better off you're going to be when people are searching for your particular brand or your particular um, line of business. Uh, but if you're, if you're not promoting these posts and blog posts and white papers and webinars, people aren't going to find you. Uh, you know, if they don't, you know, they're not necessarily going to put in their uh, printer webinars, right? They're going to, uh, if they're familiar with you, they, they might put Pitney Bowes w webinar, right? If they are familiar with the brand. And like I said, they can't be familiar if you're not paying to get them in front of the right people. Yeah, because I think things have changed a lot in that when people get interested or get into market where they're starting to feel a pain or a curiosity or some inkling of an interest, um, they're, they're finding it through their network on social media, but they're not Googling the way they used to. Is that true or is it? I find that to be absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, if if I'm looking for a brand, and you know, really B two B is is B to B to C, but a little bit a, a little bit more challenging because you're there's still a person involved, and that person is going to listen to their network when they're looking for a product or looking for a solution. So you know, when I do my paid advertising, there are such great targeting options in there. You know, I can narrow down to seniority. I can narrow down to job title, right? So I know that I can get my messaging in front of the right people. And then I can do a lookalike audience. So people that I may not have thought about in my targeting and my demographics, I can, you know, I can latch onto them as well and get the right people in front of the audience with the hopes that 
once they see that, they share that on their feed. They share that with their network. And, you know, people are more than likely to follow a brand or consider a brand if a connection is already connect, is already uh, connected with them as well. Um, you know, I'm not going to go see a movie um, if I don't know anything about it, right? But if three friends on social tell me it's a great movie, then I'm more likely to consider going to see that movie. And I think social media is the same way. You know, it's, it's changed the way brands talk to people, and it's more important for a person to consider a product if they know people who are already involved with their product or brand and are excited about it. And what uh, platform are you most uh, uh, familiar with? Is it Facebook? Is it uh, Twitter, LinkedIn? So I've been working primarily with LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, for B2B, I, you can't beat LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it is a tremendous, tremendous tool that I think anybody who's considering paid social advertising, you have to be on. Now, the problem with it is it, it's expensive. Um, you know, your CPC costs are going to come in significantly higher than they will on, on, um, on Facebook. But the benefit is, you know, Facebook, it's a little bit harder to target people based on uh, their business experience. It's, it's more based on um, likes, dislikes, brands are following, but not necessarily in the purchasing mode. And I find that people that I, I targeted on LinkedIn are, you know, if they get, if I get them to the webinar, I get them to the download or what have you, uh, or the, or the call to action, uh, they, they're more than likely to kick the tires, but not necessarily do the call to action that I want. But LinkedIn, because the, the tools are so powerful, I can get the right message in front of the right people and they're more to likely to uh, get them to convert to, to your call to action. And how about as far as them being active on LinkedIn? Uh, that, that's kind of the issue that I've experienced at that, that uh, you know, certainly salespeople are there, people, entrepreneurs are there mm -hmm. or solopreneurs. Um, but uh, ironically, I don't find that many marketing people on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because I do. Uh, you so, do? you know, yes. Yeah, so, I, you know, maybe our networks are just a little bit different. I'm, I'm connected to a lot of marketers, a lot of digital people, a lot of social media people. So my feed, you know, when I check it in the morning is full of people offering marketing advice, people sharing uh, articles from ad age, uh, people that are, you know, in social media organizations and sharing their, their latest findings, what have you. So I, I think it's all based on your network of, of what's there and what people are talking about. But I, I definitely think the, um, the, the involvement is definitely there. Maybe not as high as Facebook, but, you know, two weeks ago, they, their stock took such a tumble that <laughs> I'm afraid they may not be able to recover. Um, but, you know, LinkedIn is, like I said, I, you know, I keep harping on this. It's such a, a diverse and powerful tool that, I think people, more and more people, as time goes on, are realizing that it's not just for searching for a job, but it's really for finding thought leaders uh, on the, a particular subject matter, and um, you know, following them and using it to uh, as a, as a learning module. And how about Instagram? Are you finding success there beyond just uh, people clicking on the ads? You know, Instagram is interesting. You know, let's I'll, I'll focus on on B two B. It's, you know, I, I found that, like, for instance, Cisco is on Instagram and they do a really good job. But what they're doing is not necessarily product. They're doing uh, culture. So they're they're focusing on what it's like behind the scenes. They're focusing on, you know, come and work with us kind of thing. They're really putting a human face to the brand. Uh, but I, personally, I have found that people aren't, you know, if I'm looking if I'm working for, or looking for a GE product. GE is on Instagram and they do, you know, they do stuff, but I don't see the value. And I, you know, I recommend this to my clients as well, that I don't see the value of somebody who is looking for a GE motor part or, or, or a turbine engine. They're not, they're not going to Instagram. They're going to LinkedIn because they know there's other people who have worked on that product for, uh, you know, maybe for Sikorsky helicopters. Right. So, um, there's other like-minded people on that platform where I don't see that as much as Instagram. Instagram is great for B2C. Uh, that'll be the first to admit it. Um, it you know, I, I'm on Instagram, but most of my feeds are pictures of my children. Well, that's, that, that's it. <laughs> and 
you know, kind of last year I had that feeling about both Facebook and Instagram that you're you're kind of uh, wearing a suit to a barbecue. Meaning if you're in B2B, you're kind of like talking about things out of context, even though it might be appropriate for that person. Mm-hmm. Um, and- sure. You, you know, I, I found Facebook and Twitter um, are great for getting people excited, maybe not about a brand or a product, yeah. but if there's a event. So, you know, I've worked with a printer company and, um, you know, we were launching a new product. And there's there was we were having the launch party at Google because it was a partnership with uh, Android tablets. And we used Facebook and we used Twitter to get people excited about either coming to the event at Google headquarters in the city or getting them excited to follow along and then have my influencers talking about it as well in hopes that I could get them, find out more information about them and then connect to them on LinkedIn. Now, you, you didn't mention either YouTube or podcasts. Is are those two things on your radar? Or? Yes, you know. So uh, again, I used to, I'll, I'll use the printer client. Uh, we used YouTube, uh, but it was more for uh, products. So and you know how to use a product. I, yeah. I you know, um, it wasn't for brand consideration. It was for somebody who was uh, has already filtered their way through the fu- sales funnel and they've already purchased, and then it was really a way to keep them involved with the brand. And hopefully consider them again when it's time to replace their printer or buy a new printer for a different location. Um, I I usually don't recommend that to my B two B clients. I really, like I said, I really focus on on the big three: Facebook, Twitter, and, and LinkedIn. Um, I I just YouTube. I have found it's been a great tool for somebody who's already purchased, and you you want to keep them engaged. But for, uh, you know, for B2B products, uh, I haven't personally, I haven't found it to be successful. Yeah. That, be, that being said, I worked on a project for uh, Corny called a, a, a Day Made of Glass. And basically what was happening there was, uh, you know, Corny, you probably had those white dishes in your parents' house growing yeah. up. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that was the problem. That's how they were seen. And they were making this uh, pivot to... Uh, a technology company, right? And people didn't see them that way. Um, they were actually, they made Gorilla Glass and that was the first glass used in the first iPhone because Steve Jobs talked, had talked about maybe using a plastic cover and he realized that's going to scratch too much. It's it, the, the touch, it's not sensitive enough. So he went to Corning and said, can you make a glass that's strong enough for me to put into a, a daily use cell phone? And you know that's when they were doing the pivot So uh, the agency that I was working for at the time put together this great seven minute video. And, you know, for a B2B video, that's long. (laughs) But we made this video about how glass impacts the technology throughout your day. So, you know, in your home, when you're getting the kids ready for school, in your car, at your doctor's office, in your schoolroom, uh, in your classroom, excuse me. And it 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 kind of tugged at people's heartstrings. It was it wasn't a traditional. Here's our product video. It was really an emotional video. We tapped into the brand value that Corning has and show them, um, you know, hey, we're not just we're not just your Corning wear. We're thinking ahead and we're thinking uh, for these great products that may not exist now, but are going to exist in the future. And they need to have glass built into them. Um, It actually became the most viewed B2B video in the history of YouTube. Um, While the day that we launched it, it was. YouTube shut us down because so many people were watching it that they thought we were spamming them. Oh, that's a good <laughs> uh, problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a great problem to have. We were happy. To, we were just trying to get YouTube to turn it back on. Uh, you know, and while I was there, we made a, a, a series of the videos. So obviously, the, the second and third one weren't as popular as the first one because, you know, it, it's hard to capture lightning again. But what was great is we had put together an influencer network, people talking about packaging, people talking about glass products. We found where... Those two people, uh, those two groups of people were intersecting and they became our linchpins. And that's who we talked to. We gave them uh, an exclusive on the video and got people excited about the launch of the video. And then when it happened, it caught on fire. Uh, It was shared on Facebook. It was shared on LinkedIn, on Twitter. So places that we didn't necessarily expect it to go and it grew faster than we thought it would. But because we did our homework beforehand and got it in front of the right people, um, it, it just it just it was like wildfire. Um, but the thing was with that, it was all brand awareness. You know, there was no real call to action. There was no, 
uh, at the end of it, hey, contact us for your glass products. It was more think of us in a different light. Yep. And, you know, we were able to measure what their stock price was before the video was launched and what the stock price was afterwards it wasn't a tremendous jump. But there was definitely uh, an increase between the two. And we can attribute that to uh, people getting interested about the brand and then searching out and maybe investing in it because they were excited about the future that they were uh, presenting. And, and how about as far as like influencers, which is critical on LinkedIn to get, you know, certainly organic, but even you know, to magnify your content or even if it's paid at magnifying it. What is your strategy there? So influencers are great. You know, it, it helps expand the net that you're throwing for your brand. Uh, it's very hard. I found it to be very hard to find the influencers. You have to do a lot of homework beforehand. Uh, you have to find conversations that people are having about your particular product or similar to your product. And, uh, you know, and then introducing yourself, you don't want to come across as too salesy or too pushy. Yeah. You want to you, you need a relationship between your, the brand itself and that person. And, you know, you offer exclusives for that for them to share with their with their network or, or the blog posts they're writing on. But it, it is crucial to have a great influencer network for your brand. Um, otherwise, you know, you're just shouting into an empty room. But if you can get people to get excited about your brand. You know, this goes back to what we were talking about before. People are more likely to consider your brand when people that they're connected to and people that they admire and follow are talking about it. They're more likely to, to consider it as well. Well, well, that's it because, you know, I saw, you know, Kim Kardashian on Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> well, and I, my view on them is I like that they have no talent, which tell <laughs> because you, clearly they're doing something right. You know, where the, the not the, I guess the youngest daughter, Kylie, you know, was on Fortune magazine. Mm -hmm. And what you see is it's just influencer uh, uh, marketing at its best, as well as kind of this tribal uh, where, you know, everybody within their tribe and their inner circle and even their outer circle and their audience is part of the marketing program of their products and what they've done is you know ingenious in a way uh I, I don't know if you've studied it or looked at it but you know i'll be the first to admit i don't get it <laughs> i don't get this 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 celebrity craze that's going on for people being popular for not having any talent you know uh paris Hilton, like i don't get why people follow her i just it, it, you know, again, it's just my own personal opinion. I don't understand what the what the excitement is about that. You know, maybe they want to be them. Maybe they're excited about the lifestyle they live, and they show these glamour shots of their private planes and their and their wardrobes and what have you. Yeah. But you know, because I've been focusing on B two B, I just I don't get it, and I, I'm I'm thankful that I haven't been working in that space. Uh, you know, I'll let the younger crowd work up, worry on that, well, and I'll uh, focus on the more mature audience. Yeah, I mean, but one thing that she said was that um, you know Jimmy Kimmel asked her, um, "Are you because she's coming out with a makeup line as well? Are you going to compete against your sister?" And she said, "No, we have two separate audiences." I don't get that because I would say I I, I would think that their audiences are exactly the same. Uh, you know, I don't think there's a differentiator between, between, you know, the, I don't even know their names to be honest with you. But, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of K's in there. <laughs> I know, you know, be, between the different Kardashians, I would say their audiences are exactly the same. Now, maybe their audience is different than Justin Bieber's audience, right? You, you know, um, who's another influencer, but I would, I would think that their audiences are, exactly the same I, I just i can't imagine what the difference would be well i mean there's uh 15 years difference uh and age yeah and uh so there there's you know in that market which i don't know well at all you know yeah uh but apparently there is i mean i think there's differences in audiences between the uh hadid sisters mm -hmm. you know with only a couple years in between that you know with certain markets and that, but there's also synergy in working together because, I mean, together they have the reach of, you know, most uh, network TV channels. Oh, sure. You know, I'll be the first to admit they're brilliant. They're, they have great marketing people working behind them that are, that are cultivating their brands. Yeah. Uh, you know, 
if I were really involved in B2C, there would be somebody I would be studying left and right to figure out how they're finding their audience, how they're engaging their audience, and you know how they're really getting people to be excited about this, I'm using finger quotes, but this brand that they've put together. Um, but like I said, I just, because I haven't been focused in that space, I'm just, I'm, I'm not comfortable like uh, with a hypothesis of, of why they're popular. Sure. Like I said, I, I don't watch the E! channel. I just, <laughs> I, I don't watch MTV anymore. I just, you know, I, I've, I watch MTV and they still showed music videos. So, <laughs> well, 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 that's it. I, I didn't yeah. pay much attention. And all of a sudden, you know, because last year I was talking to somebody about it and they were like, oh, no, she's doing really well. And this is like the, the, the 20 year old or the 19 year old. Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, oh, OK. And then <laughs> a year goes by and she's on the cover of Fortune and a billionaire. And I'm like, how is that possible? Yeah. You know, I just like I said, I don't get it. It's like. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow has obviously a great actress, right? Yeah. And she has this multi-million dollar health company called, I think it's called Goop or Gloop. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, and she has, she worked, you know, she wrote for Esquire. She created this health awareness brand and yeah. she, you know, it's probably more valuable than some of the movies she's put together. And it, she's creating this whole empire and she's creating it through uh, getting people excited about it through social. Because, uh, you know, I've never seen an advertisement in a magazine or on TV or radio about her brand, but her brand is doing gangbusters and it's all through social getting people excited about it. You know, that one I kind of get because people turn to social for health issues and, you know, they want to share, you know, their food. They want to share their their success stories with weight loss. And, you know, I, I understand what audience she's tapping into. Uh, but, you know, there's there's a celebrity who uh, has a great marketing machine as well. And has really turned a, a, an idea into just this mega house brand. And what is the hardest part of your job? Is it proven attribution and value? Um, and how do, you, how do you trace that? How do you report to that? How do you kind of justify your differentiator? Oh, sure. So, you know, I, I, I've mentioned this point before. The, the hardest part is the audience analysis that you're going to do beforehand. Uh, you know, I can't in good conscience, put together a strategy for, for a brand or a product if I don't know who I'm going to talk to, right? Uh, you know, I worked for a healthcare brand that put together a, a campaign to doctors, right? So it was, it was a health insurance company. And so they did this campaign for doctors and they did these great videos that I, that I thought were clever and it was doctors talking about the brand itself, but they were getting no traction. Nobody was liking them. The com there were some comments, but they were all negative and sentiment. So, you know, putting a cart before the horse, they came to me and said, uh, do an analysis and find out why did we miss the audience or, or are we not talking to the audience in the right way? So I had to you know, roll up my sleeves, go into the data, scrape the data and find out people that were talking about this brand. You know, they were talking about the brand that was merging with another company. It was right after Trump was elected. So, you know, not to get political, but was Obamacare going to go away? Was Medicare and Medicaid going to go away? And uh, in this research, I found that the reason why nobody was responding to this is because doctors and RNs hated this brand. They absolutely hated them. You know, they didn't pay. They were rude to their customers. They dropped coverage. They dropped doctors. And had they done that research beforehand, they could have sp uh, spared themselves spending these money on these high gloss videos and actually use that money elsewhere, maybe in a public relations out outlet to get in front of these doctors and say, hey, why do you hate us so much? What can we do to change your mind and, you know, become a brand advocate for our health insurance? You know, so I had to put this this uh, report together and drop it on the CMO's desk. And it was, I, I kid you not, the most difficult conversation I have ever had <laughs> in yeah. my professional career to drop, you know, thunk this report on the desk and say, all right, it's not working because people hate you. You know, I, <laughs> I, I spun it a little bit different, but, you know, I, you know, I had to tell them, you got to do your homework. You don't, you know, you don't study for the test after you get the F, right? You study for the test in hopes that you are going to pass this test. And if you don't do that beforehand, you're just, you're just, you're talking to the wrong people and you're just throwing good money out after bad. Now, when I have you back on the show in three years, and uh, I'm going to ask you the question, where, what channel would you focus the most on to make you the most successful? You, Sean. 
the most successful in three years? Great question. The answer is, I don't know. Uh, there's come on, gonna man, be... you're an expert. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows what, what kind of platform is going to come up before then? You know, uh, everybody thought Vine was going to be the next thing. And then, you know, Twitter killed it, right? Yeah. There, was, there were Vine stars, right? Um, you know, uh, is, is Instagram going to be the big thing? Because, you know, in my personal network, I have found that more and more people are switching over to Instagram and then sharing their Instagram photos back to Facebook, but they're not interacting with Facebook directly. So yeah. is Facebook, you know, hey, MySpace, MySpace was huge when it came out. And, you know, is Facebook the next MySpace? You don't, you don't know. You don't, uh, you know, the audience is fickle. And once there's that burnout, and the younger audiences come up, they're going to be looking for a new thing. Are they going to go over to, uh, you know, a new channel? Are they going to uh, be Snapchatting about a brand? And, you know, will Snapchat, uh, when they, you know, as they're rolling on advertising, is that going to be where the next B2B is? It's, it's really hard to forecast that far ahead. But that's what's great about social is you have to stay on top of everything because there's new platforms coming out every day. Uh, that are focused on doctors or financial advisors. You know, there's uh, a, a network out of um, a London called Mallow Street, and they're just for financial advisors. And you can't get in there until they vet you and find out if you're you're in finance. And that's a great. And once you get in there, that's a great network to talk to to share stories and best practices with other financial people. But that brand, you know, that platform didn't exist a few years ago. So you know, it, it's it changes on a daily basis, and that's what I love about it is really. Uh, staying on top of it and getting excited when these new platforms come out and testing them, going going for uh, you know a, a test drive and finding out is this the best place for my client to spend their money? Um, and sometimes it's yes, and sometimes it's no. But you know, right now I'm like I'm focusing on on, on LinkedIn and Twitter. But you know, who knows? Next year, Twitter, you know, Twitter, there's you know, Twitter isn't doing that great. Sometimes, sometimes it is. You know, uh, you know, Twitter just went through and. Uh, sort of verifying, uh, you know, um, followers and finding who the bots were and scraping the bots. And then, you know, Justin Bieber saw his audience drop because a lot of people were fake accounts that were following him. So, you, you know, it's 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 got to be a platform that has a good verification that is business focused. Uh, and, and then on the paid side, they have to have a really strong advertising platform. They have to be able to drive demographics they have to have really good targeting options. They have to have really good options for your CPC and your daily budgets. Um, and, you know, it, it, I think if the next platform can capitalize on that and even improve upon it, I think that, you know, that'll, that'll be the place to be. Excellent. Hey, Sean, I really appreciate your time today. Where do people go to connect with you and review your work and uh, see what you're up to? Sure. So, like I said, I, I geek out on social. So my Twitter handle is the SM Geek. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. It's Sean S E A N. Last name is Halbert H A U B E R T. If you reach out to me, just you know, let me know you heard me on this podcast, and I'll definitely connect with you. And maybe we can share some stories and connect. And you know, let let's uh, let's see if we can work together. Yeah, as we heard, <laughs> the social media and online world is very dynamic. I know even with my own uh, promotion on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on YouTube, and as well as iTunes and podcasting, is that the algorithms change all the time. What worked one day all of a sudden changes. What I have seen work a lot this year is video, video email with CoVideo. They just came out with a Chrome plugin. Make sure you check that out. Let them know that you heard about it on the B2B Revenue Leadership Show. I'm going to have Jason Price back on the show shortly. And uh, make sure you're following their company page because that is the future. Video email is the way to break through. I'm also going to have a customer testimonial after this uh, where he's getting enormous success with my course, Start the Conversation, Get the Meeting. You can check it out at b2brevenue.com. It's a new, innovative, yet natural, organic way of breaking into new accounts, uh, engaging with them. And you can do it either on the marketing side with content or on the sales side uh, and start to understand, are they qualified? Are they in market? Are they interested? Uh, have they already looked at something that you do? Is there any interest whatsoever? If there isn't, how do you build interest and start engaging with them? This is the new landscape that we have. 
that uh, the people in market are somewhat visible from an account standpoint, but our real total addressable market is probably 99% aren't in market yet, and we have to go out and engage with them, and that's not easy to do. So in this course, I teach people how to do it. It's working insanely well for my clients. So you'll hear a testimonial. You can check it out, schedule a time to talk through it with me on the phone, see if it's a match for you, see if we can help. I can do it uh, customized per client, or you can join the group classes. Uh, It's a year-long access to it. You have office hours where you can ask any question anytime. I answer it via videos that I put into the course so everybody benefits from it and it has a sense of compounding uh, throughout the year. So you get essentially an additional 25 to 50 hours of content throughout that year to help you with case studies and examples. So here's a little testimonial. Please check out the B2B revenue page on LinkedIn and please subscribe to it. If you happen to see some content of mine, throw me a little thumbs up. I'd really appreciate it as a way of supporting the podcast. Thanks for listening. You you know, I love the approach. It's working for me just fantastic. If I sent you some of the emails, which I should, the conversations that I'm having with people, I I think you'd be blown away because they're not really about work. I've figured out if you can kind of get personal with them, like one lady, it's all about her family kids. And then I sprinkled in a little bit around work and she's LinkedIn and sending me messages on LinkedIn, <laughs> photos of her family. Um, no, I'm not even kidding. I should show this to you. You'd be stunned. I was shocked. And we're going, she, she even, we're going to launch on September 6th. And yesterday she shot me a LinkedIn message and said, Hey Ron, why don't we get on the phone and do a video call beforehand? So our lunch isn't so awkward. We're like barely not meeting each other for the first time. <laughs> oh, holy cow. Right? Like, this is unbelievable. So, this is not the first time that this has happened. She's kind of an extreme, yeah. but um, I'm starting to figure out a pattern where I can actually make this a process, you know? So, good, good. Yeah. I'll show you that. So, it, it's getting to that point. And I'm kind of, every time I do this, I'm like, God, this is unbelievable, you know? So, and it feels better too, doesn't it? Oh, Brian, let me tell you something. To be able to go go to lunch with her, I'll even talk to her on the phone, right? We're going to talk about uh, family, kids, work-life harmony, because we read. A, I shared a thing with her from Bezos about work-life harmony. This is where the conversation will start. Now, at some point, we're both not stupid, right? We know we're going to talk about work. <laughs> we know why we're both there. Right. But to kick it off this way is so much better. And to end that lunch with, the last five to eight minutes of telling, you know, well, what are you guys doing with digital?